you would, from Philippians chapter 3. I would be reading from the New American Standard, if that is acceptable. I also have the ESV. Is there a preference? It does not. Okay. Paul is here in this section that we're about to read, giving his testimony of the way Christ has dealt with him and of the great love that he has now for Christ, whom he once hated. Here, the testimony of Paul, inspired by God to be placed in his word, and we hope tonight to look at something of what that means. Beginning in verse 4 of Philippians 3, the word of God. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, and that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are mature, have this attitude, and if anything, in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example. And observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, so stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Thus the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Would you take a moment and pray with me before we enter into this passage? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the amazing truths of your word. We may have read and studied your word for many years, but we know that we will never exhaust the wonder, the beauty, and the profound truths that are contained upon every page. And so even tonight, as we gather once again to worship you and we have read this passage, may your spirit be our guide, not just outwardly, but inwardly, that we may may be moved by him in understanding, in grasping, in being challenged and confronted, in rejoicing, And may it honor and glorify you, O God, 
that you will make the things of your word clear, both through the speaker but to the hearer. For we know that in our own experience, O oh God, there are times you deal with us from a passage that no one else seems to have been dealt with in that way. It was just, as it were, from you to us as we listened and as we found application to our living right now. Speak to us where we are, Father. May it honor and glorify you, and may it indeed change us a bit more into the image of him who is our Savior, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. God saving and perfecting his people. After a lot of decades of studying God's word, I, I come more and more to see, I think, <laughs> I think, more of the big picture. Not just today, this moment, this circumstance, but to see it in the picture of the whole, to the best that I can in the moment, of what God is doing. And I confess to you that many times I have no idea what God is doing. I know he's at work. And if it were not for the encouragement that I see in passages like this, I probably would just wilt and give up like many of you. Not that you have, but that, that together we would probably be in that position. If we did not have the hope that God is at work, and as Paul said in this very book, as he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I will confess that I've not always realized that. I've not often thought of that, pondered that appreciated that and rejoiced in that. God is at work in your life and mine and has been for a lot longer than we realize, as we'll see in Paul's testimony in a moment. But here in this verse, in chapter 1, verse 6, we are reminded that God indeed has started something and he will finish it. My dad passed away a little over a year ago, and he was notorious even unto the age of almost 94 uh, to have a project in mind and a project in action. He was not only notorious for that, he was notorious for never finishing those projects. And uh, when my sister purchased the farm, she purchased a lot of unfinished projects lying in the field under the shed back here and there, and uh, that was my dad. Always had something in mind he wanted to do and always about something, but he would get stirred up and just not finish and go on to something else. I thought about that many times and appreciated the fact that that's not the way God is. God doesn't start something and get halfway through and say, oh, I've got other things to do. Our joy and our hope and our confidence is what the Lord has started in you and I, he will bring to the day of completion. And many times in the circumstances of our lives, I believe very much that we need to see that bigger picture. And even though we do not know where we are in that picture in terms of what God is doing right now, we can know that God is bringing us to that day of completion. That ultimately will be the thing I'd like to stress as we go through. And then also in Philippians chapter 2, at verse 12 and 13, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence but more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And there it is. God is at work. He is at work not just to improve me for my own sake or, or to bring about what satisfies me the most. God is at work to bring 
what he wills and what his good pleasure is. And that's sometimes painful. It sometimes hurts. But Paul says, work into your life, as it were, this salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you for that which pleases him. I believe those two references lead up to chapter 3, where Paul gives his testimony. And I have come to believe that Paul's testimony is actually an expansion of what he has just said, because God is at work in him. And when you look at chapter 3, you can break it down into maybe four parts. And the first part is in verses 4 through 6, where Paul is talking about his life before Christ. His testimony was interesting. He was a very arrogant man. <laughs> he was so filled with himself. And all through his accomplishments, he, he thought he was pleasing God, when actually he was living a life wholly contrary to God's will and God's purposes, apart from Christ. Paul had quite a few things to say about his accomplishments, as you would look, and I will not go into those, but uh, in verses 4 through 6, he was a zealous man, he was a persecutor of the church, he was circumcised at the right time, he was born into the right tribe, uh, he pursued and was advanced in the law, a Pharisee of his day, a learned man, and he thought he had it all together. He was not seeking Christ. He was seeking to destroy Christ and his people. So it was not that he was a seeker. He was a destroyer of the Christian faith. But while he was out to destroy what Christ was doing, Christ was seeking him. And I love that. It reminds me that it is not we who seek God. It is God who seeks us. That's what grace is. It is God reaching down, seeking, and not seeking, hoping, but seeking to do. It is God seeking the sinner. For he has a purpose in that sinner's life. That purpose is to save that sinner, to forgive that sinner, to use that sinner's life, and let me go ahead and say it, to conform that sinner to the image of his son, fully, wholly, completely. And I have come to believe that is why God does many of the things in our lives that he does. That's why some of our circumstances are hard and difficult, because God is at work pruning, purging, and bringing us to conformity to Christ. And as God does that, it's painful. I remember many, many, many years ago, decades ago now, when I was at Reform Seminary back in the 70s, uh, Sam Patterson was preaching a sermon. And I've long remembered that sermon from John 15. And he talked just briefly about how if the tree, the apple tree, if you will, could talk, it would, it would swear that the owner was trying to kill it pruning it back, all of its juices being used as the tree thought, you know, to produce this big tree. But the owner didn't want a big tree with lots of leaves. <laughs> he wanted a tree that produced fruit. And for the tree to produce fruit, it had to be pruned. Much of it had to be cut back, cut away. And if the tree could talk, and I'm using Sam Patterson's language here, uh, if the tree could talk, it would talk of how painful this is and how it did not understand. And yet the owner knew exactly what he was doing because when the time of harvest would come, there would be luscious fruit upon this tree. And it would, uh, it would all be to the profit of the owner, not to the profit of the tree. And I remember as he preached that sermon that day, I was humbled to realize that God is indeed at work. 
I did not so fully understand then. I don't even believe I fully understand now. But I know the truth of it. All the circumstances of our lives are ordained of God to be used in a way that will bring forth that final outcome of your conformity to Christ and mine. That's what God's all about. So it began with a sinner who was arrogant, self-centered. And you know, even sinners who are not religious are just as arrogant and self-centered. We're all that way. Apart from Christ, I think more of me than I do of you, and you think more of you than you do of me, at least for the most part. That's just who we are. That's how sin has affected us far more deeply. I've come to believe that God is about the business of rooting out far more than you and I realize. We think of ourselves as good people. And when we compare ourselves with others in the world, maybe we are, maybe we aren't. But we're not comparing ourselves with others. We have to be compared with the holiness of God. And when God looks upon the heart and he sees everything there is to see, more than you and I can see, the sin is greater far more vast, far deeper. And if we are going to be brought to conformity to Christ, a great work has to be done, a great deal of purging, a great deal of cleansing, a great deal of cutting away as well as building into. There has to be a transformation of the life, a transformation of the heart, but it's far more radical, I believe, than you and I understand or can understand. But we can appreciate that God, in the person of this man, was about the business of transforming him from the arrogant sinner that he was who despised Christ to the man who would then be able to say in his testimony, which I would sort of say is, from verse 7 to 11, the converted sinner's testimony. He said, all those things that I used to think were just so wonderful, so important. They are now but rubbish. All those things that I used to just brag about and delight in, they mean nothing now. For the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. One thing we can say about Paul he was not a part-time Christian. Christ consumed him. Christ was everything in this man's life, in his thinking. Christ was becoming everything in this man's heart. He said in another book, it is not even I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I think somewhere along the way, Paul lost himself in Christ, as it were, in a good way. Because the man who once talked about his accomplishments, his life, and bragged about it, now could only boast of Christ his Lord. I believe there are many in the church today who are so far from that reality. They are not filled with Christ. They are not possessed by Christ. They are not consumed with knowing and loving and serving the Lord Jesus Christ, there's still too much of them living within. Paul's testimony here in verses 7 through 11 show us the great change that has taken place since Christ has come into his life. It is humbling for me to read these words. And to know that this man has been with the Lord now for 2,000 years, roughly. And to know that one day you and I will join where he is as we wait for that day when the final completion, consummation comes forth. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then in verse 12 to 16, I believe the heart of the passage for us as believers. Paul speaks in these verses about something in his life that now consumes him. I'd like to reread these verses. Beginning at verse 12, 
reflecting back to verse 11, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want to pause there. I want to ask five questions. Question number one, what is Paul hoping to attain in verse 12? What is Paul pressing on to when he says, I press on? What was he laid hold of for when he says, I seek to lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of? What was he laid hold of for? I ask also, what is the goal? What is the prize that he talks about in verse 14? What is the upward call of God in Christ? To what? What are the answers to these things? What was it that Christ was pressing on to? What was it that he felt God's upward call leading him toward? It would appear in the context that he's talking about heaven. Because in the final two verses, he says our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. Heaven is the result of something else. Heaven is where we will wind up in the presence of God, visibly able to stand in his presence but heaven is the result. It's not the goal. It's not the prize. It's not what he was laid hold of for. There's something more. There's something else. What is it? Have you caught the thought of it? The word is used twice in this passage. And I'll read you Another passage that Paul wrote is in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Now, I prefer the rendering of the uh, New American Standard because it actually uses the word that's in the Greek where the ESV gives it a little bit different translation. But let me go back with you to Romans chapter 8, and I think you'll see what it is that Paul was laid hold of for and what the goal is, and what the prize is. And it's not just heaven. Romans 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's often the section of Romans 8 that's jumped past. We talk about the predestined, we talk about the called, justified, glorified. We talk about the golden chain from eternity to eternity. We talk about a lot of things. We talk about the verses right before that. We talk about the verses after that. But most of the time, we just sort of skip over that one a little bit. And I think it's so important that we not. Because Paul reveals here that the purpose and the work of God in the believer's life as he has predestined that individual what has he predestined us to? Heaven? No. That's the result. God has predestined you and I to be conformed to the image of his Son. To be like him. Not to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to be the Lord of glory. Nothing like that. But in our sin, we are impure we are imperfect. We are more so than we realize, and the great work of God 
which he has begun, which he will bring to completion in the day of Christ Jesus, is none other than he will so transform you and I. That as he says, at the end of the chapter in Philippians, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity. And here's where the New American Standard translates it that way, where I believe the ESV translates it slightly different. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. That's similar, but it doesn't use the word. Paul uses the word in Romans 8, 29. It's the same Greek word that he uses in the two passages here in Philippians 3. I prefer the word to be transformed and to be brought into conformity with the body of his glory. One day that will be complete. But right now it's in process. God has already begun that. And one of the things that I believe I missed when I was younger is the reality of this whole picture that we see in Paul's testimony of God reaching into the life of a sinner who despised him, but who thought himself to be very religious and God-honoring. And he transformed that man's mind and his heart and his life, and he started making use of this man in a powerful way. But what Paul did outwardly, ordained of God, in eternity may not even be as important as what God did inwardly in him. And to see his testimony and the contrast between confidence in the flesh and confidence in Christ. Self-glorifying to Christ-glorifying is a radical change. And it evidences the transformation that was begun but I hear in the words of Paul in this middle section that he's not just sitting and waiting for heaven. I believe many believers today have expressed faith in Christ and they know there are some things that they should be doing right now. But they're really just waiting for heaven. They're really just looking forward to being in heaven one day. They haven't captured that God is at work now. So that the apostle in his testimony says that in his current life, he is pressing on. He is not looking back, but he is looking forward. And each day of his life, he is pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ, which means not just the state of heaven, but a complete radical transformation of his mind, his heart, his life, his very being into conformity with the perfection of Christ that he may be able to stand visibly before the God of heaven and earth. One of the warnings that we receive in Scripture back in the day of Moses when Moses wanted to see God up there up on the mountain. Oh, you know, there are a lot of places. Someone asked me one day, he said, of all the places and, and situations in the scripture, you know, where would you like to have been to see one of them? I don't, <laughs> there's so many. I, but on that list would be that day to see what Moses saw, to understand what Moses came to understand about God. When he said, I just want to see you, and God said, not possible. You could not see me and live. You could not look upon me and survive. So how is it that one day we will be in heaven face to face with God, visibly in his presence and not perish? It will be because God's radical work through his son has been made complete. What God started, God will have finished. And you and I will be prepared to stand visibly in the presence of this great God, and that for all eternity. And so here, Paul talks about this current 
portion of his life. He's no longer the man he once was. He is now a man in love with Christ. He knows Christ, but he wants to know him more. He serves Christ so much that he has given his life entirely to the service of Christ. Even he, in that context, says, I press on. I press on for the goal of the prize, the upward call of God in Christ. I pondered what that looks like in your life and mine. I certainly haven't pondered it enough because I don't believe I understand beyond maybe a few things. What was Paul pressing on, pushing forward, pursuing, literally is what the word means, pursuing Christ? Well, as we look for application in our own life, some of these things come to mind. For example, one of the goals that you and I ought to have as a believer, because we have this relationship with Christ, is that we may know him even more fully. That we would pursue knowing him with a richness and an intimacy, is, as it were, in the relationship that never stops pursuing. You know, many years ago, and it's been a long, long time ago now, when I first met this lady named Linda Felty, I thought, she's cute. And then when I got to know her a little bit, her voice was different. She came from East Coast, Virginia. She said weird things, <laughs> like, rang the boat, get the mouse out of the house. Oh, I loved it. I loved to just sit at the table with her in college and just listen to her talk. And then I suddenly realized, <laughs> I'm more interested in this lady than I thought. I'd never been so interested in anybody in my life. What's going on here? We started spending more time together, getting to know each other. We got married, still getting to know each other. And still to this day, 40, 48 years later, I, I want to know her better. Well, there are some things that, you know, well, okay, we won't go into those. But if it's like that for someone we love here on earth, how much more so for the Savior who has bought us with his own blood? Do we have the pursuit in our life that simply wants to know Christ as fully as we can through his word, through prayer, that we can possibly know in this life? In our pursuit of Christ, and that's one example, do we desire to submit our lives to his ways both outwardly and inwardly? One example is in Philippians chapter 4 where Paul, where Paul says whatever is, whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is honorable, whatever is, and he uses several words. He said, think upon these things. Do these things. Someone mentioned to me several years ago about one's thought life. And I remember at Village Chapel mentioning this in one of the sermons on this, and, and I had several people look at me rather puzzled. I said, how's your thought life? We are really good at cleaning up on the outside. We are. <laughs> but God doesn't look on the outside. He looks inside. He looks at the heart. Now you talk about a radical transformation. Oh, only God is going to be able to. But Paul says, whatever is honorable, whatever is true, whatever is right, I would say, whatever is centered upon Christ and honoring to him, let your mind dwell on these things. Think on these things and do these things. And just in the one area of our thought life, though we may have cleaned up the outside and we've got a, we've got a couple of good things going on that we're serving Christ and we're maybe satisfied with that. God's not looking at the outside so much as he's looking at the inside and he knows what's there. So I ask you this evening, as an example of our submitting ourselves to Christ, how's your thought life? Is it worldly? Is it sinful? Is it Christ-centered? Is it God-honoring? 
there's one area in most people's lives, if not maybe everyone, to varying extents, where the word repentance comes into play. And that would be another part. This whole matter of God transforming us, God at work in us, convicting even us. He convicted us once of our sin enough to show us our need of Christ. Has he convicted you of the sin that's there still that would lead you to repentance for the sake and honor of Christ? Well, I once posed the question to a particular congregation, not, not, not asking for an answer, just posing the question. What sin or sins have you become aware of in your life in the last two years that you have struggled with and sought repentance and gained victory over in your relationship with Christ? The answer to that will show whether or not there is any measure of repentance in our lives. And much of the repentance is not necessarily outward behavior. It is the inward state of the heart, the desires of the heart. I remember also in seminary, Dr. Jack Scott was my Old Testament professor and my faculty advisor, and he was a humble man. And I remember in a prophet's class, he spent an entire lecture on the use of the word heart in the book of Jeremiah. And I'll tell you something. Even at Reformed Seminary, Dr. Scott could have given an invitation at the end of that lecture, and all of us should have come forward. He spoke of the heart that God sees fully in all of its intentions, in all of its desires, in all of its wants, in all of its pursuits. So much of it's sinful. Here's an area, just one area, where God is at work, challenging, calling us to think upon the things of himself, not the sinful things of the world. Here's an area of repentance that is inward, not because of outward behavior, although there are also outward behaviors that many express as well. Serving Christ by serving others. No one's done more than Paul. Here's a question. Was Paul the super Christian that very few could ever be? Or is he intended to be the model of someone who knew and loved and walked with Christ? The answer you give to that question will answer many others. He's not the super Christian. Not in the sense that very few could rise to the level. And it wasn't Paul that rose to the level. It was God at work in him. He makes that clear in chapter 1, verse 6. He makes that clear in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. He makes that clear in this chapter as well. It is God at work in him. It is God at work in us. It is God at work bringing about his will, his pleasure, what glorifies him and what glorifies him is to take a people who are absorbed with themselves, focused upon their own life, caring nothing for him, and then bringing them to the knowledge of Christ, converting them, making them his own by the blood of his son, and then transforming them both in this life and finally in the life to come the transformation that will be so complete, the heart, the mind, the spirit, the life, everything about us ultimately so transformed that we will be able to stand in the presence of his holiness visibly. That to me as I grow older is one of the most amazing thoughts and amazing realities in all the scripture. What is God going to have to do to make you and I capable of standing before him? When in the day of Moses, he said, no man, no man can see me and survive. And yet the very intent of God is to bring his people to that point where they can stand in his presence visibly for all eternity. 
That is a radical transformation. And it's at work right now in your life and mine. Do we know that? Do we sense that from the scripture? Are we challenged by that? Does it cause us to draw back to his word and say, oh Lord, this excites me that you're going to do this. That this is your intent. And then ask him consciously to do that very thing. Which will mean that by his spirit, he will begin, no, he will continue, he's already begun, he will continue to purge, to rebuild, to prune for his glory and honor. In John 14, Jesus said, this is eternal life. What is eternal life? Is it living forever? No. <laughs> well, yes, but no. <laughs> yes, we will live eternally, but that's not the point. When he said, this is eternal life, that what? You know the answer? That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship. It's not a duration of time. It's not a particular location even, although that does exist. It's called heaven. It's more than that. It's a relationship with the living God that the sinner can have because of the blood of Christ and which begins that process of transformation that God won't let go of until we are wholly made complete to stand before him. Won't be finished in this life, but a lot of it will have taken place. I trust it will. As I look at Paul's testimony and see, here's a man who presses on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. He does not look back he does not cherish the things of this earth. He cherishes Christ. He lives for Christ. He seeks conformity to Christ. Because Christ is to him everything. Now, I will pause and just say, I do not know how God means to make application in your life to all of this. Maybe this is just an initial challenge to look at. Maybe it is the thought life. Maybe it is that you still pursue the things you want to pursue and haven't even given thought to Christ. Maybe it is that you're somewhere along in the process but just need to be encouraged to press on, as Paul did. Paul pressed on until the day when he was taken out of this world. It was he who said... I wrestle with whether to be here, which is better for you. <laughs> he didn't say, which is better for me. He said, which is better for you, or to depart and be with Christ. You see, even there, Paul was not thinking of himself. He was thinking either of others or of being with Christ. Great challenge. I think a great encouragement. And I have come to believe this is where our great hope lies. That God has begun a work in us. That the world cannot stop. <laughs> that even we cannot stop. God has begun it. God is doing it. And God will finish it. And you and I are blessed recipients and participants. And we are participants. We are participants, conscious, striving, struggling, knowing, loving, serving, sacrificing for the one whom we look forward to seeing. As Paul said in this latter verse, 
our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our humble state into conformity with his glorious body. What more could you ever want for God to do? And here's the hope that we have. Here's where our, my joy lies. Here's where I find peace because I am in Christ. Paul says that I may be found in him, not with a righteousness of my own, but with his righteousness here unto that day. Would you pray with me? Father, the profound nature of your word humbles us as we consider this passage in this man who went from despising Christ to so loving and longing for Christ and knowing Christ and pursuing Christ that it consumed his life. What a testimony. Even this night, Father, as we worship you, we pray that you would take these thoughts from this passage bring them to bear upon our own minds and hearts and lives as you would be pleased to challenge us in all that you are doing that often baffles us, but we know what the outcome is going to be. Standing before you, complete in the one who gave himself for us. Even now, Father, as we continue and we come to the table that our Savior prepared for us, that we may be in remembrance of him. Would your blessing rest upon us here, we pray, for that encouragement and challenge that we ever need and the gratitude that once again we are reminded of for his being the Savior that he is. Father, in his name we pray. Amen.